Hi, I'm Phil Donahue. And I'm Marlo Thomas. And we're going on a series of double dates to find out what makes a marriage last. That old expression, is there a doctor in the house, was never more fitting than one afternoon when Marlo and I had the doctor in our house. Rebecca and Dr. Sanjay Gupta were in town from Atlanta, so they dropped by our apartment to talk marriage. From the first moment they walked in, you could feel their calm compatibility. They have three daughters and a busy life, and they do a lot of philanthropic work together. It's a relationship that's built on different cultural backgrounds. Unlike Rebecca, whose family is Scandinavian, Sanjay grew up with a distinct sense of being an outsider as an Indian American in a small Michigan town. I don't think people knew what to make of of Indians. I was the only Indian, you know, really uh, there. So we, there was no, there was no history with. I was obviously different colored skin. I had a funny name, you know, all that sort of stuff. But other than that, there was no, there was no institutional prejudice right. that I that, that I experienced with like with with Rebecca's family. Obviously, any any of that sort of stuff. There was other prejudices just because you were different. Uh-huh. But that was, that was that was a totally. Were different you bullied? Thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, where I grew up, um, especially if you're the only person that looks like me, you tend to then take on the characteristic in other people's minds of every sort of, you know, fringe group. So, you know, for for example, the Iran hostage crisis was happening in 1979. You remember? Uh, Jimmy Carter was president, and, and um, I was 10 years old. And I'm not Iranian, but, it, it you know, it didn't matter. You You were suddenly somebody else you know you were an outsider uh during that time so i remember that being a really hard time the Mm. iran hostage crisis for Mm. because it was such a such a big thing in the news and and every day it was something you know um and you know it didn't make sense for me to remind people i wasn't iranian it kind of was (laughs) missing the point right Right. but so so yeah there was there was there was a fair amount of of bullying i think that happened um, you know, younger younger years in particular. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is I think Detroit is unique in that it has, that's how it kind of, it's a huge immigration community, but mm-hmm. everybody stays in that's like right. their little neighborhoods. That's right. Well, the largest Arabic population outside of Saudi Arabia I know. is in Dearborn, I think, right? Dearborn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My yeah. dad was born in Dearborn. Oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 So that's is right. he. I imagine that Sanjay's childhood experience would cause this couple to have completely different points of view. That's what I would have thought, too. We um, kind of grew up similar, so we have very similar values. You grew up similar. Yeah. See, it's hard to say that with his parents being Indian and mine not, I guess, <clears throat> but um, we both came from small towns in Michigan and both came from parents of, like, you know, working, you know, white collar parents kind what of did thing. You, what did your parents do? Um, my father worked for Ford Motor Company, just like his parents worked for Ford Motor Company. Oh, wow. Um, you know, they all of our parents just, their one desire was us to have a great education. And this, then they made, all of them made sacrifices for that to happen. And we kind of have that in common. We, we feel that that's important when we have other... I mean, we both grew up drinking the same powdered milk kind of thing, so we have things that were in common for us. Mm -hmm. You're Rebecca Olson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a character in a family sitcom. Uh, I think it was a character in a couple books, but you know, Tom Tom Sawyer Sawyer and a few other before that. Rebecca Olson marries Sanjay Gupta. (laughs) Wow, that That was a great winning invitation. (laughs) Was that okay with your parents? My... um, it's interesting. I, I think there there was a, a a deep desire, especially for immigrants, uh, to have their children marry within the same culture. My parents were a little different. It was interesting. My my mom um, was from Pakistan, what is now Pakistan. She fled during the partition, so she was a refugee child for the first twelve, fifteen years of her life. Um, and my dad was was in India, so they're both Indian, but. But for my dad's side of the family, she represented a very different part of India. All, so different that it was like a completely different country, completely different culture. And and when they got married, neither one of their parents attended the wedding. Oh, well, 
Well, so they in protest, you mean? Well, yeah. I mean, they just they didn't support it. They uh-huh. didn't support the wedding, and and um, well, in that day and age, just they both would have had arranged marriages, and instead, his parents met right. in the United States, uh, outside of their own parents, and because they met in the United States and not some, neither of them had their own parents arrange who they were going to marry. Both of their own parents were kind of like, mm, this isn't what we set up. This isn't our tradition. So they were a little bit against his parents being married. So your parents married in this country. They married mm-hmm. here in the and States. And they both immigrated here. Mm-hmm. They both immigrated. And getting married here, <coughs> a love marriage, as opposed to an arranged marriage, as Rebecca said, was very unusual. I mean, I, you know. And a bigger o- deal in the over 60s. Over time, I didn't. Now I've met tons of people who are my contemporaries, Indians, whose parents, uh, all of them had arranged marriages. So I, I, we haven't found anybody else that sort of got married the way that my parents did. And as a result, my friends, especially my, my friends who were thinking about getting married, uh, especially if it was someone who was not Indian, it was always my parents that they would go to to talk really? to. They became those parents for you know, all my friends who, who wanted, okay, you guys did this sort of very radical thing by having a love marriage and you weren't even from the same part of India, the same caste, the same background. How did it work? And so when we were talking about getting married, while there, I think, still a desire uh, on their part to, to, for me to marry somebody Indian, they were much more, they, they had lived through that. They uh, lived through it. Although I say that at the beginning, they still really wanted him to marry somebody Indian. Right. And, um, and then while we were dating and they realized that it was, that we were more likely to be together, then they started to, you know, be more accepting of it. Did so. you have Indian girlfriends before then? Um, yeah, I did. Kind of thing. Nothing too, too serious, but yeah. Um, and it was all in college, you know, it wasn't anything earlier. So it was, these weren't necessarily, you know, my dad was funny. He, 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 um, he said, I don't want to meet any of these girls unless you're going to marry them. <laughs> That's basically what he told me. <laughs> and my mom sort of followed that and, you know, was in line with that. So they're not frivolous people. They're, you know, they're, they're engineers. They're, they're, they're mathematics people. They didn't talk about love they didn't talk about marriage they so it you know if i brought home a girlfriend it was like look you know are you, are you marrying her is that why we're meeting her or, <laughs> or not uh, what's so, the point yeah what's the point <clears throat> so, yeah it really was what's the point they didn't they, there wasn't a lot of they're not a particularly emotional couple they're, i mean they're loving but they're not very emotional in uh-huh. this regard so my dad still shook my hand i mean yeah. every single time i, I oh, there really? was no hugs until i came along and now, if I don't hug him when I walk in the door, he's like, where's my hug? You know? <laughs> oh, so nice. it's sweet how they've kind of warmed up to. You know? part, and part of that, I think, is that like my mom's parents and my dad and my dad's parents and my mom, they didn't, because again, there was this friction that always existed. So you could feel it. As soon, when it for me, when it was when the grandparents were over, it was a palpable tension. Uh-huh. And there's a lot of nice to meet you, you know, because shaking it hands. Because it wasn't arranged. Because it wasn't arranged, and they felt like they were very different backgrounds. And, and I, I don't think that my, my dad's parents probably ever, even till the very end, fully accepted my mom. Wow. My mom was, family was not very devout. My, my dad's mom was probably the most devout Hindu out mm-hmm. of all four grandparents. Mm-hmm. Um, she was Jane. She was a Jane, which is a, a very sort of a more strict Hindu you know, tenant. But I think, you know, just because my mom's parents were, they were fleeing. They were, you know, fleeing persecution. And, you know, the idea of religion was a bit of an indulgence, I think, for them. You know, we had a little, we had a little deity in our house growing up. But, you know, there weren't any temples. So it wasn't like we could really be devout in the United States uh uh, at that time in the 60s. But but they had experienced religious perse- persecution in Pakistan, which For is sure. what caused them to leave. That was so the they big were thing. definitely more reserved about showing any kind of religious. And what about your parents? How did they feel about your marrying a Hindu person? Um, well, good question. <laughs> um, my dad had passed away <clears throat> um, long before him and I started to date. He, he probably, um, uh, who knows how he would have reacted. I think we would probably have been fine by the time we married. Um, my mom... <laughs> so very encouraging. He probably <laughs> would have been fine. He would have been fine. No, I mean, like, he'd gotten, like, 
you know, he was, um, he was, he was Finnish and Swedish. So it wasn't that he, he was just like, you know, we stay at home and we do our things and we, it wasn't until they retired that they suddenly developed this huge social life. Right. And I think my dad probably would have had been very similar except for the fact that he passed away before, you know, before he even retired. How old was he when he passed away? 50. And and what about your mom? How did she feel about Sanjay? Oh, she she loved him. She she my mom's just a big sweetheart. She loves she she thinks he's so smart and fascinating. And even to this day, she's like, well, um, I want to know where he is because <laughs> I worry about him. And and she's very like like humble and shy around uh-huh. him. So it's kind of sweet. Right. <laughs> my mother was Italian. She's gone. My father was Lebanese. And they were the children of arranged marriages. Mm-hmm. You know, but both both my grandparents were arranged marriages. Uh, but my mother didn't like Irish people. Yeah, you know? I read a huge article about that. Did she live here in in New York? They lived or? in Michigan, Detroit. Oh wow! In Detroit, uh, in a sort of lower middle class. I mean, her father was Italian, and they had two trucks. Mm-hmm. And they sold produce off their trucks. So there they were five kids. They went to school. They had an education. And uh, my grandmother stayed home, but she was a singer and got little jobs singing at the synagogue or the church or whoever would have her. She would love to sing. But um, but they, in those poor neighborhoods, you know, the Jews were, were, had their area and the Irish had their area and the Italians had their area. And so the Irish were considered sort of the lower class people. And shanties. The, the shanty Irish. So my, when I first told my mother I was going out with Phil Donahue, she said, oh, he's Irish? And it was like, my mother had a thing there. And then, well, then she got to know him and she loved him. Well, he won her over. He said, with his Irish <laughs> malarkey, you know, she, he won her over. So how did you meet? How did we meet? <laughs> At a bar. This is a classic American story. <laughs> Mutual friends that Mutual introduced friends. us uh, in college. Yeah, we went to the University of Michigan. Uh-huh. Yeah, and um, I think when we met, we were both dating someone else mm-hmm. at the time. Mm-hmm. We definitely had more of a shared experience right away. We just had a lot that we had in common to talk about right out of the gate. Um, and I think you were thinking about. I mean, so, I know you, we were taking. She was taking a lot of science classes. I remember that because she was really good at it and. And I was thinking I needed to get my act together if I was going to go into medical school. (laughs) It's funny that he says that. We'll have more after a quick break. We're back to our conversation with Sanjay and Rebecca Gupta. It seems these two have found the path to harmony together. But as we all know, spending a lifetime with another person requires some doing. Especially when it comes to dealing with each other's differences. You're absolutely right uh, that there's accommodations that you have to make. And, and like, I'm, I'm a really neat person. I'm, I'm not maligning people who are not neat. But, but I think that for me, you know, it's just, it's, it's just how I am. You're a neat Nick. So, uh, I'm a, uh, <laughs> and and she's not. So it's not, it's not that I'm not a neat Nick. There's just there's only so much time in the day to get everything in the world neat. His office is like nothing on it, like the <laughs> one little computer. Because his life is he, it's like on the computer. He can store everything there. He writes everything there. Maybe a glass of water. I mean that is his desk. And my office is a constant mess, and there's everybody's in and out of my office, and they trip over stuff and knock it all over the place. And he walks in, he's like, "My mind is gonna, lo- I'm gonna lose it." I'm like, "Just shut the door. That's how we can get along. <laughs> you just shut the door." I get, I get a visceral sort of pain as I, and she says, oh, "I can't find something." I'm like, "Oh, really?" <laughs> <laughs> but I was, what I was gonna say though is that um, the accommodation uh, are all offset by trust to me. You know, and that's probably the, 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 the heart of the whole thing is that, like, I don't trust anybody more than I trust Rebecca to have my best interests. And that can be with regard to, you know, our financial stuff, but also, like, I don't know what to do here. I'm, I'm dealing with something. I'm not sure what the right answer is. And there's no absolute right answer, but there's probably a right answer for me. And so who do I, who, like, who would... Who would be able to answer that? 
And I think my parents can't answer that because ultimately they, they, they're incapable, I think, fundamentally of seeing things from outside their vantage point. They can't put themselves outside their own shoes. It's not a bad thing. It's just who they are. She can. I can tolerate the messy office and I can tolerate because I come home at the end of the day and, and I'm dealing with stuff. And it, it was always me. I was a pretty solitary creature. And then all of a sudden I, I started like dabbling in this idea of letting someone else in. And she's, she's really good at it. And I trusted her. When you have a big argument, does one of you pout or fall yeah. silent or? Yes. I mean, the big <laughs> yes arguments ever really end. I mean, he's still mad about me for buying him a hand sandwich, like, you know, 15 years ago or something. I mean, some big arguments <laughs> was like last years ago. on and on. And then they become, even though they might be like poking at a, at a splinter, they're still there. They almost become kind of, you know, like a running joke or something. We've had big arguments for sure. And I think the longest they've lasted is probably uh, a couple, three days in the sense that not that, not, not that we're at it for a couple, three days, but we're definitely still pissed off, mm-hmm. both of us. And, and, but, you know, um, I came from a, real, a pretty sedate household. I could probably count on one hand the number of times I was really yelling as, when I, as a child when I grew up. And I can remember those times because they were so jarring, you know. So it's not really the style, I think, for us to have like a, a big argument in the sense that it's explosive in any way. But I will get upset. I'm much more transparent about it now. I would hold it in and expect her to figure it out. And and then I realize at some point that was a waste of time because why am I waiting for her to figure it out? I can just tell her and, you know, it's not, then at least I can get it off my chest. Um, why do you think you were waiting? That's an interesting thing. Because I was being passive aggressive. I, like if she didn't figure it out, I could just stew even longer, you know, about it. Uh, you know, like I, I was being feeling vindicated that she didn't even know why I would be upset. Like, how could you know? Like, you, I've been married how long and you don't even know this thing about me, you know? So um, th- th- there would be that that part of it. Um, I, will, I will say, and I think this is a little bit of a difference between uh, men and women, although, uh, you know, I can't obviously speak for all men or all women, but, uh, you know, I have friends, but I don't have a lot of friends that I would talk to about that kind of stuff. So she was the person that I would talk to. There were times, too, when I would look at him and I'd say, can you not be angry? Because I need to talk to my best friend right now to how to solve this problem. Hmm. And that would help him go, okay, yes, we need to kind of shift gears into from the emotional we're upset about, whatever it is that has caused us to be upset, to the intellectual, what are we going to do about it now? It's really hard for me to be mad at him for very long because he always makes me laugh. And he... uh, He's, he, he's so smart that it really, you know, keeps me going, makes me constantly be on my toes, mm-hmm. which I, I love that. What do you think are some of the, a couple of the things that you have to have in order to have a marriage last? Genuine respect. You know, I, I think um, everything else follows from that, probably. And, you know, there's people who you might really um, like and even love, but maybe when you really think about it, you don't respect them in every single way mm-hmm. um, and then trust for for me I you know, I don't know maybe, maybe it's because I I didn't have a lot of people that I trusted uh, and uh, so um, you mean as a child or what? yeah as a child and even you know I mean when you go through um, med school and it, it's it's a, it's such a competitive environment you know um, uh, you know where, where I, I started I was accepted into medical school out of high school um, Wow. So it was a program that did that, and everyone was very, some of them are my good friends now, but it was very competitive environment. Um, you know, people sabotaged each other's experiments, and no one was rooting for each other. Everyone was rooting for themselves. And um, so trust in that environment was challenging. I think once I got into training and neurosurgery training, it was, it was better, because now we were all sort of a more shared experience. But well, what is, what are yours? Are, do you so, have- um, so I was a family law attorney, so I represented people in divorces or people who were at that point where their relationships were going the wrong way. And um, I can tell you the number one thing that causes people to divorce, from my experience, was resentment. 
and resentment can if it, when resentment starts then all the other things go when you know when like if he's working really hard and making all the money and i'm you know and he resents that you know i'm not contributing to that or if i'm with like babies crying and you know having no sleep and i start to resent him for being on the road and getting 8 hours of sleep or something and resentment really only can be cured through communication before the resentment builds and I, and i have to say there've been a few times when i will say to him i'm working way too hard and i and i need you to notice i think that's a great point i haven't heard that before that you notice something that is making you go, get to the brink of resentful and so you know the only way out of that is to communicate and he works so hard at making sure that he is home mm-hmm. you know he set up he operates every monday just so that he's home every weekend oh so that way that he's always there you for games out, yeah. and, so. you do stuff without the kids together yeah yeah i mean you yeah. we'll do trips yeah. yeah we have a um we have a group of friends that we we travel with uh you know one once a year maybe twice a year depending mm-hmm. and then and then Rebecca and I will we'll go out on date nights you mm-hmm. know we'll go just go out to dinner mm-hmm. um I'll just lock the door more so <laughs> now you know that the kids are you know they're more independent yeah <clears throat> if there was a young couple here about to be married or thinking about getting married or on the fence about getting married what do you think you would want to pass on nothing in life is is perfect and i think you know perfect is often the enemy of a very very good and 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 i you know we say that in the operating room a lot i just want to take out this last piece of tumor but it's right again something important and if you do that you could sacrifice all the incredible work you've just been doing for the last several hours in search of perfection i think it's the same thing in in marriage i mean you know once you've committed then being in search of perfection can be a destructive force and that's something that i think i learned and i would pass that on and we do pinch ourselves every day and just think ah oh, we got really lucky you know if you can internalize that i think that's a really powerful force that sanjay and rebecca gupta i can't decide what impressed me more how nice they are or how smart they are but more important they have a quiet and deep understanding of each other Now we can say we know a doctor who makes house calls all the way from Atlanta and brings his wife. Until next time, I'm Phil Donahue and I'm Marlo Thomas. You guys have been great. Really so honest. Oh yeah, yeah, good. Nice. I, I said, yeah. Sweet. We've never, you know, so we appreciate the conversation, That's, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Double Date is a production of Pushkin Industries. The show was created by us and produced by Sarah Lilly. Michael Bahari is associate producer. Musical adaptations of It Had to Be You by Stellwagen Symphonette. Marlo and I are executive producers along with Mia Lobel and Lital Molad from Pushkin. Special thanks to Jacob Weisberg, Malcolm Gladwell, Heather Fain, John Schnars, Carly Migliori, Eric Sandler, Emily Rostek, Jason Gambrell, Paul Williams, and Bruce Kluger. If you like our show, please remember to share, rate and review. Thanks for listening.